Oh, there we go. Um, da, 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 da. background music we have here but um as we've got people joining us now um i just wanted to kick us off and thanks so much um everyone for coming along to our demographic dividends grasping the retail opportunities of healthy aging webinar today um i'm lily party i'm head of project at ielts uk and um we'll be moderating today um we've got a really really great panel of speakers today um and it's also brilliant to be uh, partnering with the Healthy Aging Challenge Community of Practice, where lots of our participants are coming from to, uh, today as well. Um, and that network is run by Innovate UK um, and their Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, and we've also been doing some work with UKRI and the University of Stirling on an innovative project looking at how um, retailers can support healthy aging. And um, my colleague Elsa will be talking a little bit more about that in a second. So before we um, dive straight in, um, some really quick housekeeping. So um, we've got a little bit of time at the end for um, Q&A um, with, with our speakers. So if you sort of move your mouse, you'll see a little Q&A tab at the bottom. So put your questions in there if you have any. Um, and we'll be recording uh, the webinar today as well and sharing that on YouTube and, web and our website afterwards. Um, so I think I'm going to pass straight over um, to Karen Wilkinson from um, the UKRI, UKRI community of practice um, to, to give a few little introductory words. Hi, uh, thanks Lily and uh, hello everyone. Um, yeah, it's lovely to see you all here today. Uh, so just a little word uh, from the Healthy Aging Challenge Community of Practice. So uh, as Lily mentioned, I'm Karen Wilkinson, I'm the Community of Practice Manager um, and it's it's a real pleasure to be working with ILC to co-host co this event today. Um, in case people haven't uh, come across the community of practice already, we're a network which is run out of Innovate UK KTN, and it's to support knowledge exchange and, and collaboration all across healthy aging. Um, so we run events uh, like this one. Um, we produce a monthly newsletter and it's uh, full of news items, funding, other support and opportunities to get involved. So a uh, quick plug, if you're not already a member, um, uh, you can sign up to a really quick and easy process and I'll put a link um, in the chat. But other than that, that's it from me uh, and I really hope you enjoy the event. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I'd love to introduce um, Elsa Forbes, who's a Retail Impact Fellow at ILC, um, to quickly come in as well. Thank you, Lily. Um, it's great uh, to be here and um, thank you all for attending. Uh, just a little bit more about the uh, retail project. Um, we've got three principles um, with this project, which is to support retailers to better understand the evidence about what healthy aging means to inspire action uh, by re uh, retailers in relation to their role in supporting healthy aging and transforming how the retail sector sees and serves older consumers. And this is an 18 month project. So delighted to uh, be uh, assisting with this. Um, and throughout the year, we'll be releasing um, five information guides um, which are aimed at contextualizing and disseminating um, different areas of retail uh, from the retail environment to uh, leisure and hospitality and high streets and neighborhoods. So uh, please do keep in touch with us and um, uh, we'll be delighted to update you when we're ready to release those. Thank you, Elsa. And I should mention that um, if, if you do have any sort of direct questions to any of our panelists or you want to find out a little bit more about Elsa's work um, just just use the chat function you can either 
you know, communicate with one of our speakers directly um, or just introduce yourself and say, say where you're coming from. Um, brilliant. So um, I am very excited to be introducing um, Professor Hanu uh, Zarievi, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about the potential of retail lo loyalty card data for healthy aging. Um, just to pre preface, um, Hanu, unfortunately, we won't be able to stay all the way until the Q&A. So if you have any specific questions uh, for him, then please put them in the, in the Q&A now. And Hanu's also said that he'll be able to stay on for about a quarter of an hour afterwards. So if you have any comments, questions, put them in the chat. Um, so Hanu's research and professional experience is centered on customer experience, strategic marketing and management and service and retailing. Um, with particular work um, on service business models, business transformation, reverse use of customer data, and reconfiguration of marketing. So, Hanu, over to you. Um, looking forward to hearing about it. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Lily, and thank you for the, for the introduction. Just to make sure that you can see my slides probably now. Could you confirm that? Yes, they're coming up. Thank you. So, <clears throat> greetings from, from Tampere University, Finland, and thank you for the invitation to uh, share some of our recent work on the potential of retail loyalty card data. And uh, in a way, the very purpose of, of this presentation is, in a really nutshell, provide you some food for thought uh, related to how food retailers, uh, customer loyalty program data could be used for various scientific purposes and, and also for societal uh, well-being, including healthy aging. Uh, at them, in, in Finland, uh, we have been working with this so-called low-card research project for a few years. And uh, the very idea of, of this research purpose <clears throat> is that, as we all know, uh, consumers' eating behavior holds many major implications for health, well being, environment, and, and society at <clears throat> large. And uh, our uh, collaborative effort between two universities, between uh, Tampere University and University of Helsinki. Uh, focuses on exploring these themes through vast amount of, of customer loyalty program data. Uh, and we are conducting this in close collaboration with S Group, which is a, a cooperative retailer in, in Finland. Uh, and uh, S Group has uh, uh, as high as 46% of a market share in grocery retailing in Finland. Uh, the Nordic countries in general, uh, they are highly concentrated. Uh, and, and for example, in, in, in Finland, the three biggest players in, in food, retailer, food retailing account for 95% of the, of the market. And uh, what we have uh, achieved uh, uh, an access to food purchases of approximately almost 50,000 households across the country. And, and this data includes over 130 million uh, shopping events. And in addition to this purchase data, we can link the, the, the data with additional survey data. Uh, including various uh, socio-demographic factors, uh, food frequency questionnaire, consumer attitudes and motives, and, and so on. And this altogether uh, enables uh, a detailed investigation of, of various consumer groups' food purchase behavior, including also older consumer groups. And in addition to the current data set, we are at the moment preparing a, a new data collection that we hope would take place uh, during this spring. And, and this would include a data period from, from the beginning of 2019 until the end of 24, including, for example, uh, the COVID pandemic, 
uh, and, and the re re recent inflation as, a, as an example of the, of the interesting phenomenon that has taken place during this, this period. Well, <clears throat> this is quite a multidisciplinary research project and there is four professors uh, who act as principal investigators. Uh, there are two professors in nutrition and, and one in biostatic, biostatistic. This, and, and I'm, I'm a professor of marketing at Tampere University, but, but in, an, in addition, there is a, a various number of, of expertise involved with different kinds of scientific background, including health data sciences, business studies, consumer behavior, uh, economics and public health, to name but a few. But okay, what eventually can we then do with this type of data and 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 there are I have uh, I will now illustrate few examples of, of our recent studies that have used this type of uh, data. Uh, for example, we have looked at how consumers purchase preferences very gradually evolve between uh, red meat poultry, fish, and vegetarian-dominated uh, diets. And, and for example, on the, on the left-hand side here, you can see what is the preference persistence probability for those households that have used to purchase red meat-dominated diets. So what is their preference persistence probability to, to stay there? And it's almost over, it's over 80%. And if you compare that with, with other, other diets, so there is a clear difference. And, and also what is quite interesting that we, what, we, what we can do with this type of data is that we can look at what are the de departure probabilities from red meat preference to another type of uh, diets, or even what is the entry probability to vegetarian preference. And then we can see that it's most likely most likely to take place from the uh, fish dominated diets, as you can see on the right hand side uh, figure. And this is uh, a recent study that, that was published last year and you can see it referenced down in the, on the, on the slide. But just to, to provide you some, to, to illustrate some examples of what we can do with this type of data. Another example comes from another recent paper that looked at how uh, the, the, the al alcohol consumption or alcohol purchase behavior in Finland uh, was influenced by the uh, alcohol legislation change that took place in the beginning of 2018. So uh, this is another example what, what could be done with these type of data sets. And of course we can go deeper into, into a detailed level of analysis, including various consumer groups. So we could, for example, investigate that how alcohol legislation change influences older consumer groups, uh, alcohol purchase behavior. And uh, last but not least, another example of, of what is going on <clears throat> Uh, at the moment is that uh, there is another study going on that uses uh, nearly 4,000 uh, loyalty card holders ranging from 65 to 90 plus years. And, and we are looking at uh, what kind of clusters can be identified uh, within this group of cardholders with the aim of constructing these clusters based on socioeconomic variables and place of residence and comparing that with health related food expenditure from, from 28 food groups along these uh, clusters. So this is something that is now, now taking place because it's quite interesting to look at the, the how 
how healthy or or how how differently older consumer groups eat in terms of more healthy food groups and in a way as a conclusion i would in a way say that food retailers customer loyalty card data offers a novel method for the study of purchase behavior uh, of varying consumer groups so not only at aggregate level but when we are using customer loyalty card data and and uh, linking that data with additional survey data we can come up with or come up with really enriched data that allow us a uh, really uh, detailed investigation of various phenomena related to food purchases and and at the end of the day it can naturally offer also new understanding of healthy aging for scholars practitioners and and policymakers as such and here are some of our recent examples uh, of of the publications that we have uh, done and i'm happy to ask any questions or comments uh, in in the chat especially so thank you for 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 my part thanks thank you hanoi it's really fascinating i mean there's so much interesting data in this space and it's basically live data right so there's so many insights about how we lead our lives i mean I think we're so interested in this retail space, sort of us as ILC, particularly because it just touches our lives so much. It's so policy relevant. Um, you know, the places that we go to, the types of choices we have in terms of products and services, the ways we engage with it. And, you know, it's not just about the products and services we end up getting and how they directly impact our health, but also, um, you know, how it helps us building social connections and all these um, things. So fascinating to see that. and. Um, and such a great sort of um, source of data and where we can see what what's changing, where people are making uh, choices and why. Um, so having looked at the Q&A for now, I haven't seen anything directly um, related to this. We've had quite a few questions through um, already in registration. Um, but yes, absolutely do use the chat. I've seen some people have already um, introduced themselves. Um, so I'd like to pass on next to um, Andrew Goldacre, who's the CEO of the British Independent Retailers Association, or BIRA, um, who's going to talk a little bit on sort of high street challenges for um, retailers and how we can enable sort of healthier choices for consumers. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, BIRA has been supporting independent retail businesses for over 120 years. Um, and it's, re it's, it's thousands of members from single retail outlets to small change. Uh, chains and large department stores. Um, Bira's benefits provide independent retailers with genuine savings of crucial business services, as well as helping them to keep their business ahead of the curve. So thanks so much, Andrew, for joining us. Um, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Lily, for that introduction. And uh, well done for covering everything that we do. So uh, you're, you're a good recruit already. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. And and as Lydia explained, we we represent thousands of these smaller family-owned businesses that you see on the high street throughout the UK. Um, not necessarily not necessarily the city centre businesses, but those in the suburbs and market towns, the tourist destinations, etc. Um, but we are also members of the British Retail Consortium, um, which is where the large retailers sit, and, and that gives us a fantastic insight to aspects of retailing um, and the challenges faced by retailers currently and in the future. In respect to the challenge here, I, I, I generally believe that part of the problem retailers um, have here is, is, is really a lack of understanding possibly on, on the opportunity presented by, by an aging population. Um, I think all too often I'm bombarded with information about opportunities to engage generation X, Y, Z. I'm not sure what the next one will be. Um, and yet really there's a generation out there that, that we all know a lot better um, can all relate to a lot easier. Um, and yet, you, you know, I think there's a lack of understanding of, of what the scope of the opportunities, the size of it is. And I think there's education. That's what I would say. Education and belief that that opportunity really exists. Now, some do it very well. I, I know many independent retailers, by virtue of where they are located, by virtue of what they do, 
their customer is naturally a little bit older, a um, little bit more mature, and they're very much entrenched in, in servicing a community and all sides of that community. So, so some do it very well. Others, there's, a, there's an education aspect that needs doing. The other real challenge at the moment for, for the retailers of all shapes and sizes um, have been manifest from the last three years. We've had two years of a massive disrupted COVID period with, with shutdowns, lockdowns, reopenings, lockdowns, social distancing, safety, all sorts of scary stories as to why you shouldn't go into a shop um, as opposed to, to the benefits that come from being um, on, on, a, on a vibrant high street. And now we are, we are presented with um, a cost of living crisis, which is, a, is, is again, this huge disruption in a different way. This is about businesses trying to focus on the here and now from a business point of view. Um, and all too often you see other positive agenda items fall down the agenda at that point. Um, and I think again, addressing and, and seeing the opportunity from a, from a healthy aging population falls in that category. We've seen it with net zero recently. Um, there's a huge appetite among, among businesses to reduce their carbon footprint. It takes time and money. Um, and, and the current crisis isn't allowing a lot of breathing space in order to do that. So I think, I think current business focuses are not necessarily on, on too far reaching opportunities, sadly. Um, and I think, again, that's another area that we need that educational, that insight aspect to, to help large and small retailers seize the opportunity that, that's coming, coming their way. And you're actually not coming their way, that actually exists now. Um, a, a, another real genuine concern at the moment, and, is, and this is particularly in, in the smaller places, is one of accessibility. Um, all too often, in, we are seeing conflicting, I, what I call conflicting ideas, where um, pedestrianization based on reducing traffic, based on reducing carbon, based on reducing, on protecting the environment, all of which is so, so important still. Um, it's producing problems with accessibility. Now accessibility, and, and often what, what I'm presented with from planners and town centre developers and and local authorities is that this is great because they're going to encourage everyone to to cycle into the place and enjoy and then cycle back home and, and encourage a healthier lifestyle can't argue with that um but it's not necessarily aimed at this aging population i'm afraid who need different forms of transport to to access their local town center um and and i think too often many due to covid but covid's given the opportunity for local authorities to, 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 to implement ideas they've probably been thinking of but haven't got around or couldn't implement without COVID giving them that opportunity. But the ideas are not cohesive. You know, we, we've seen the whole high streets blocked off, which is fine, but there's no investment in the infrastructure to bring people into it. There's no investment in, in thinking, well, how do we give the whole of community accessibility here and not, not just those lucky ones who are absolutely 100% fit and able to do so. And then that causes problems for businesses because they're not getting the footfall they once had. They're not seeing the sort of customer base that they, they need to, to prosper. Um, and, and so we do need cohesiveness. We, we do need to ensure that, that the planners or local authorities, the people making important, hugely expensive investment decisions in their place of a town center, in the place of a, of a, of a, of a large village suburban area, and not just a, a really thinking about the, the stakeholders in that, the businesses, the community, the consumers. That needs to be all, all, all around thinking. Really. I think all too often, it's, it's start, the, the plans are driven by one dominant stakeholder um, or one long-term well-meaning vision, but it's not necessarily cohesively bringing everything to it. Now, we have seen good examples of this in the past, and, and I'm sure we'll see it in the future, but it's important we highlight the, the positive examples so that others can, can learn from it. Um, a, a, a constant, I've, I've been involved with Vera for five, six years now, um, and one thing has been very constant, and that is the, the burden of, of business rates that, that we see faced by, by retailers. Um, in fact, by all businesses, but retailers, especially on the high street, uh, feel, this, feel this more than most. Now, why is this a burden? Um, it's simply a burden for, for two or three reasons, really. One is it's a massive cost of business that 
it, 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 and and I've not yet met anyone in government um, in um, uh, select committees, uh, local MPs, local authorities who actually agree it's a fair system uh, of taxation. It's a poor tax. Um, it's good in that it's easy to collect from a treasury point of view, but it's not necessarily representative of what the business needs. And it doesn't tax a business according to the business's relative profitability or opportunity to make profit. Um, and it's counter investment. You know, if, if a business um, wants to improve its its operation, it, its premises, if it wants to make the premises better, and this could be in the form of air conditioning, it could be in the form of improving the accessibility, it could be in the form of, of increasing the space available um, by, by acquiring a, an empty premises next door. It, there's many reasons, but as soon as, as soon as that improvement is done, the business rates will increase, even though the business needs time to actually see the benefit of that improvement. So why would you then invest if it's if, if you you know your costs are going to increase on day one, but you're not necessarily going to see any improvement from day one, need longer term to do it. And that's that's the very nature of business rates, that counterintuitive nature of it. And that you'll not meet a retail organization that doesn't consider wholesale reform as necessary. It's whether or not any government can be bold enough and brave enough to do that. Because if you give people the opportunity to invest in their businesses and actually encourage it, they will do. I've seen wonderful investments from uh, within our within our membership community, small and large, where they recognise the need to improve their premises, to improve their offer, to improve the customer experience. And that could be older customers, it could be younger customers. Um, and they want to keep on doing that. But given the financial challenges they've got, given the, the, the crises that they've come through in, in the last two or three years, they need real encouragement to part with hard-earned cash um, because it has been so hard-earned these last few years. And I think that, that is the, the challenge facing lots of retailers is that they're battered and bruised and, and they want to do more. They want to, to learn more. It's giving them that breathing space. And I think business rates is a, is a clear way of, of, of doing so. And, and one final point I, I would say, and I think one of the questions in advance that you shared with us touches on this, is that, and this is where retailers share the responsibility, I've got to be honest, um, it, it's about training and recruiting and, and using your resources properly. I think when, all too often when we talk about resources, we, we focus on cash resources and financial resources and technology resources. The most important resource to most independent retailers being singly owned businesses will be their people resource. Um, and how do you recruit the best people? Independent retailers, the ones I visit and I get out there as much as I can around the UK, um, they often have quite a mature workforce. Um, and, and that's because they want to work locally. They want to work in the business they are part of, they're involved with and, and, and often friends of almost. Um, and they want to be part of, of their local community. And I think that for an independent retailer, they, they often work really hard to recruit people who know their community and also know their, their potential customers. Um, the larger chains find it harder, and it is harder at the moment to recruit people. There has been a, a, a loss of employment, of available employees seemingly, um, not just retail, across hospitality, across most sectors. It's often said it, it's people who've decided to retire early, the ones who who are no longer available. Um, well, I think retailers, we all have to work harder, therefore, to A, attract these people back into retail. We have to make retail seem exciting and vibrant and inclusive again. Um, and at the same time, we have to then ensure that they get really good training, both on the technology side, the way retail is developed in terms of its systems, but most importantly, what does good customer service really look like for all your customers, not just young people, not just middle-aged people, but, but if, you, if you are aiming for an older customer, we, that, that service needs to be different. It needs to be targeted. It needs to be better. And I think, again, that's where retailers can invest internally to improve their, their ability to, to really meet the needs of, of all the customers that they hope to, to achieve. It's a fantastic opportunity. I think the work done has helped me understand the opportunity that, that, that an aging population presents. I think I think you know the thought that 63p in the power by 2040 will be the average consumer spend by an aging population. Retailers is about selling stuff. You want to be able to sell stuff, and clearly, an aging population is a market that wants to buy. 
So let's match the two together. Um, and, and there's a bit of work internally to remove barriers. There's a bit of work with external stakeholders to remove barriers. And, and I think we all, there's a, a, quite a lot of work in terms of raising the awareness of just how big an opportunity this is. Thank you, Angie, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, our sort of key theme really that we group all of our work under is this idea of a longevity dividend, as in the fact that we're living longer being an opportunity and a good thing if, if we get it right, as you say, making sure that accessibility is right, that we've got the right people. Um, and um, we did a project of work that we published at the end of last year, looking at um, particularly how retail environments can cater to people with dementia. Um, but clearly lots of these messages, you know, and what works, works, works for most people. And, and the key thing around people, like you say, is actually breeding that sort of culture of kindness, having the personable um, contact being really key. Um, and I think you're, you're clearly right. I mean, there has been crisis followed by crisis over the last few years. So I think it's really key to think about how we can make the incentives right so that it's not just a nice to do, but a, that it fits and aligns with what sort of needs to happen anyway. Um, and potentially sort of a, a bigger role for regulation, but I guess we could we can come to that in the discussion. Uh, so thank you, Andrew. Um, and I'll be passing over to, to Stephen now. So um, Stephen um, Spencer is going to talk a little bit about um, particularly sort of customer service and the role of the what's been termed the 15 minute city so the idea that all your services um, are reachable that you sort of need within 15 minutes um, but I'm sure Stephen will talk a little bit more about that um, so Stephen Spencer's business journey started in the high street at age 15 and took him to Regent Street by the Tower of London and to Buckingham Palace by the age of 30. Um, as he says, a combination of luck, curiosity and thinking differently, though clearly hard work as well, um, has enabled his contribution to the cultural retail revolution of the early 90s. Um, and since then, Stephen has worked with, studied, learned from and helped some of the brightest stars and most prestigious brands in the retail, leisure and tourism sectors. Um, and he's particularly interested in the future of employment and of the high street. Thanks so much for joining us, Stephen. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Lily, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen, if I may. So please let me know if you can see that. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, although I think you're sharing the wrong screen, if that makes sense. So um, we can see the next one coming up and the time. Ah, uh, okay, <clears throat> just bear with me. That. <clears throat> see, this is one of the few forums where um, I feel that it's actually an advantage to be an older person and um, Consequently, other than being white and male, I, I'm sort of doing quite well. <laughs> um, okay, so is that better? Um, I can't see it coming up yet. Um, don't know if others can. So I don't think you're sharing anything yet. Right. Okay, yes. Now. Yep. Perfect. Yes. yes. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the 15 minute city um, because I'm assuming that people know quite a lot about it, but and also because I haven't got 15 minutes. But what I will do is touch on the 15 minute city concept in relation to a city that I'm speaking from south of at the moment, which is Oxford, um, quite a lot on how humans experience, because I think this is relevant to all customer experience, but, but particularly um, has to be thought through um, for older people, old, older customers. Um, a little bit on technology, understanding and maximizing the benefits of both physical and digital customer experience. And the way forward with a spaceman, this is kind of a concept that I dreamt up about eight years ago, and I thought this was a good opportunity to uh, give it an airing. <clears throat> so in terms of um, the 15 minute city, this is an article which very fortuitously came out this month in Time Out. 
And on the left is the definition that Time Out gave of the 15 minute city. Um, those of you who are familiar with the concept will probably recognize, I think probably they just Googled and looked at what Wikipedia said. But, you know, as they say, a town or city designed so that pretty much everything you need in your daily life is no more than 15 minutes walk or cycle away. Bearing in mind straight away that, of course, older people may not be so able to walk or cycle. Um, and then uh, one example is Paris, whose mayor, Anne Hildago, has led a huge campaign to build more public parks and cycle lanes. But this, um, as the headline rather dramatically says, uh, Oxford at the centre of a global 15-minute city storm. I think this kind of sums up why some of the initiatives to um, improve city centres, town centres, the future of the high street are so problematic, certainly in terms of their implementation. And Andrew made this point about post-COVID improvements that um, haven't been thought through or perhaps aren't fully funded. The council um, proposed installing 50-minute neighbourhoods in its plan to 2040. Uh, unlike, as, as the article also goes on to refer, the, the right-wing conspiracy theorists um, who would have us believe that this is all about controlling people within uh, neighbourhoods so that, that uh, we can keep an eye on them and monitor what, what they do and how they behave, which was part of this controversy, the other part of the controversy was the council also announced traffic reducing measures. So a term which has become an absolute hated term in Oxford, LTNs, low traffic neighbourhoods. And whether it's um, bollards or, or pallets with flowers in them have popped up all over the residential areas of the city, stopping the unwary driver from actually accessing a road um, that they previously did. Uh, an example of this would be I go to my dentist, which is just off the Cowley Road, which is a very vibrant, multicultural and um, broad in its demographic um, part of Oxford. And I can no longer park near the dentist. Um, and if I do manage to park uh, and I don't always know how long I'm going to be in the dentist, um, when I try to drive home, I find that I can't because all of the routes that I would normally have taken are blocked off with no indication of which way I should go. Now, for me, that's just annoying. For an older person, it's probably um, much more challenging, especially if they have accessibility needs. Um, and on top of that, um, the, um, the way that this, this has been done um, doesn't seem to be part of any, any bigger plan. And the most sort of pertinent uh, uh, symptom of it is that local businesses, including some retail businesses that have been in, in the area for decades, if not over 100 years, have actually closed down because, as they say, their customers can no longer get to them. Yes, there are bus routes. Yes, there are park and ride schemes and all the rest of it. But it isn't a cohesive and coherent plan that allows um, me to access the services I need easily um, and, and without uh, great difficulty. So stepping back, we need to think about um, how people experience, and, and this particularly goes to older people. I, I believe that older people and people um, with some form of disability, and of course there's a lot of overlap between the two, are an enormous market. Somebody I'm going to quote from shortly is Tom Peters, who wrote this book a couple of years ago called Excellence Now Extreme Humanism, and um, one of the things he says is the average American household buys 13 new cars in a lifetime, seven of them after the head of the household turns 50. And there are many other stats, as he says, oldies have all the money. And how could marketers be so clueless? And so is written with a lot of O's. And it goes to the point that Andrew made about, you know, this is a market that we understand, we can, we can access, we can relate to who probably are still likely to shop in shops, in high streets, um, even if they supplement that with online shopping as well. And as another of my gurus, Lou Carboni, who kind of coined the co concept customer experience, um, you cannot not have an experience. So for local authorities, for town planners, for retail businesses, your customer, your, your stakeholder, your employee is having an experience of your brand, regardless of whether you've planned it or not. So you might as well 
planet within um, the what I call the customer realm. This could be a, a town center. It could be a shop. It could be a visitor attraction. It could be a website. Are all the elements, you know, there's retail opportunities, there's um, facilities, there's uh, catering, there's information, there's the core proposition, the core experience. And we encourage our clients to map the experience. It, it's a concept I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's called customer journey mapping. And it thinks about all of the stages of the journey to and through a destination or a business and what the interactions are between the customer and that business. The touch points that really count are called moments of truth. When you actually start to add that to what is going on in the customer's mind, in the environment, um, and um, in, in all of the, the channels um, of, of communication and, and, um, and buying, um, then you see how complicated it is. Now, another book I commend to you is why We Buy by Paco Underhill. I know I'm talking to a very retail savvy audience, so you'll know that Paco is the past master of interpreting how and why people buy. And some of the key principles when we think about the customer journey are that arguably advertising is dead. It creates awareness, nothing more. How people actually determine whether an experience is good or not is around word of mouth. They tend to seek the opinion of other people like them. So, for example, is it accessible? Has it got something for me? Is it worth my while getting out of my house and going to that uh, destination or that, that store? They may well use computer home PC. They may not use mobile as much as a younger audience. When they arrive, there'll be first impressions. There'll be what they see. There'll be this whole concept of the decompression zone where they may or may not um, take in any information at all. And then where is information positioned? Can they see it? Um, is it accessible? Um, what is the core experience they've come for? How well is that delivered? The peak experience is critical as is the end experience because um, psychologists uh, show that the peak end experience, the peak experience and the end experience. So is it the toilets? Is it was I thanked? Uh, was I encouraged to return? Will shape how I feel about this experience, perhaps bolstered by or supported by the aftercare. But that will go to the reputation, which is fostered again by word of mouth. And you can see how advertising may be completely left out in the cold. So we need to understand how people experience and we need to build, I would argue, a model like this. This is based on um, actually a Disney model, um, and I call it stars. The first S is for story. What is it that makes a destination unique? We know about book towns and food towns. Most destinations don't have such a strong, cohesive organizing thread, but they should, in my opinion, um, You know, which should include um, how are they accessible and, and appealing to older people? Um, the team, and again, to Andrew's point, you know, why would older people want to come and work in this business? Why would young people want to be passionate about the business and engage with, for example, older people? Because they understand the story and, and, and it's authentic to them. A is for ambience. I'll come back to that, but that is how the experience is delivered. R is for recipients. In my opinion, town planners, as well as retail businesses or any customer facing business doesn't spend nearly enough time on real granular and meaningful uh, research into who its customers are and how they feel and what their aspirations are and, and you know what they really want from us and once you know that you can systematize the experience systems are about how you actually deliver the story through the team and the ambience consistently um, and I talked about ambience. I was very excited to find this study by Rockefeller University about uh, experiential branding. And they said that, um, uh, or they, they found that customers remembered 1% of what they touch, 2% of what they hear, 5% of what they see, 15% of what they taste, and a whopping 35% of what they smell. And, you know, we know how powerful uh, smell is in triggering um, emotions and memories. Do those smells need to evoke nostalgia 
or luxury or Christmas or uh, tasty food? Or have we not thought about it at all? Is the music appropriate for the environment? But I noticed that these percentages only added up to uh, 40, uh, 58%. So I wondered what the other 42% was. This isn't science, but I call it the sixth sense. And this is when it is all working together, when it's cohesive, when it's when it delivers authentically through all of the senses. And it's an incredibly valuable piece of um, insight, I believe, for all businesses. I promised you a bit of technology. This is one slide on one use of AI. Now, I love this quote. I mentioned Tom Peters, um, which is in intelligence augmented versus artificial intelligence. To me, the idea that artificial intelligence is just that. Intelligence augmented is about how we use data, how we use machine learning to make better decisions as humans for humans. Um, I work with this wonderful guy, uh, Cesare, who um, has created a business that works with, with attractions, with destinations, with towns and cities, using AI to build a predictive model to allow them to target their investment in resources, in signage, in stock, in other, um, uh, other uh, things that cost money to maximize their return on investment through maximizing the delivery of the customer experience of the story. And finally, and we've stopped moving, completely stopped moving. Hang on, just bear with me. Sure, no worries. There we go. So I promised you finally a spaceman, um, and I, I thought we'd continue the, the Bruce Willis theme here, bless him. But um, my question is, how do we make our policy making and the way we implement um, work in a more responsive, dynamic and sustainable way, and, and particularly in a, in a joined up way. This is um, a, a model I, I developed after I'd worked with some small destinations, including in Scotland. Um, and um, the idea is that without all of these elements, you won't have a successful destination or high street or, or even business improvement uh, program. Uh, S is for service could also be the story, the service proposition developed and delivered by the businesses themselves. The pioneers, the early adopters, they're the people who show the potential, the advocates. We need to have the right people on board to help us to spread the word. Communication, a com communication plan that is not one way, but is genuinely two way and um, works throughout the, the process energy how do we get things to happen how do we get small wins how do we keep moving forward all the time towards our vision and and on that uh, idea identifying milestones and celebrating successes to show that we're moving forward authority is about the destination or the business owning the proposition how can we own being the most accessible um friendly to older people healthy sustainable engaged and engaging um uh destination or business and finally next steps having a plan thinking ahead but being able to be flexible a lot of these town center initiatives are either very short term or very long term i think they need to have the ability to be medium term as well because medium term is where things tend to change uh, the most rapidly and the most significantly. So um, there we are, the 15 minute city customer experience in 10 minutes or maybe just over, but thank you very much for your um, attention. Thank you so much, Stephen, and some really, really interesting um, pieces in there. When you say that, that sort of you can't not have an experience, um, I guess similarly designers particularly would say you can't not design something, you can just design <laughs> it well or badly. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yes, I, I think one thing to note as well is clearly in the context of aging, there is this sort of growing um, consumer base of older consumers. But I think just as much we want to be thinking across the life course. So how can retailers actually support us to age healthily right across? Um, Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, 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 the benefits of shops that have short supply chains that are community focused um is that you you create a cohesive destination and, and that has mm. well -being benefits as well as whether people are eating healthily as well um, and exercising um so you know it, it it's it it goes with sustainability 
it also is better for us and and definitely i think better for older people as well yeah Brilliant. Well, well, thank you so much. And I, I'm sure we'll pick some of these themes up again in the discussion. Um, so we've we've spoken about all bits of the journey, really. We've spoken about sort of products and food that can keep us healthy. We've spoken about places, how individual retailers might adapt their offer. Um, and we're now going to not live, unfortunately, but um, hear from Tim Etherington, judge who has sent us in um, a video recording this time. He said, though, as well, that he's very happy to answer any questions that come up, come in. So if you have a question, put it in the chat, we'll send those on to him. Um, and so Tim Etherington Judge is um, the founder of Healthy Hospital, uh, which is a nonprofit organization um, with the dream of a healthy, happy hospitality industry. Um, so looking particularly at staff wellbeing, um, they operate across the globe. So wherever hospitality operates, um, and offer training, workshops, digital classrooms, brand activities, um, and so on. So um, I think Andrea has already prepared the video for us, so um, I will pass on to that. Hi, my name is Tim Etherington Judge, and I'm the founder of Healthy Hospo, which is the hospitality industry's first dedicated health and wellbeing training provider. Uh, I started Healthy Hospo back in 2016 after a personal experience um, led me, you know, working in the drinks industry and hospitality industry my whole life, living, um, living a kind of night lifestyle, excessive consumption, uh, complete lack of sleep, terrible nutrition, uh, and also the isolation that can come with the industry um, kind of led me down a dark path. And in 2016, I attempted to commit suicide in a hotel room in Athens, in Greece. Uh, it was coming through that experience that led me to start Healthy Hospital. You know, I heard from lots of people who told me their stories, their struggle with the industry, you know, and, and that there was no one doing anything about it. It was just a kind of churn and burn where you, if you have a problem, people just kick you out. No, there's no sympathy. There was certainly no one talking about mental health. Um, or sleep or nutrition for the industry back in 2016. So, you know what, once I found this out, I really knew then that I had to be the man to try and do something. You know, what kind of man would I be if I just sat back and said, there's a problem here, but I'm not gonna do anything about it. So that was the kind of foundation of Healthy Hospo. And today we train people around the world on how to be healthier and also how to build healthier businesses. The hospitality industry is not a healthy place to work. As you can imagine, it's late nights. It's the lowest paid industrial sector in the world. In some studies, that has the highest rates of drug abuse and the third highest rates of alcohol abuse of any industry in the world. 95% of women that work in the industry say that they've been sexually abused. So there is a lot of issues going on in this industry and we really need to start turning it around and that's what Healthy Hospital is trying to do. It's, it, you know, it's a long path and a long road, but we're starting to, to take strides. And one of the things that we've done recently is um, look at digital solutions to help with our training. Hospitality is an operations focused industry. So it's really hard to kind of get decent training into the industry because you know the restaurant, the bar, the hotel has to be open. And when it's not open, you know, you're asking then people, so you're asking people to then come in on their days off, when they're not at work um, and giving up their own personal time to be able to do training. So, you know, with all of the, these problems, we, we do in-person trainings, but we've also developed a digital learning platform using um, current technology called Learn, Words, Learn Worlds. And we've taken all of our kind of industry leading health and wellbeing training that's written specifically for the hospitality industry. And we've turned it into to digital content that um, bartenders, chefs, waiters, uh, bar managers, restaurant owners can access 24 seven, wherever they are in the world, um, on their phones, on their laptops, uh, for an extremely cheap price. You know, our foundation package starts at five pounds per month, and you get access to hours and hours and hours of training programs covering topics uh, as diverse as sleep and financial health, through to how to, to run healthy operations within your business, um, leadership, um, how to deal with anxiety, uh, depression, 
uh, and lots of the other things in between. You know, we're really trying to build a, a holistic training platform and coming at it from a from I would say a preventative point of view. You know, there's lots of organisations that are doing amazing stuff around mental health awareness, maybe mental health first aid, providing support networks for when people have um, mental or physical health issues. And we're trying to come at it from from the other angle. And we're saying, you know, if we can build health or help restaurants and bars and hotels build healthier cultures inside their business, and we can also help train uh, hospitality workers to lead slightly healthier lives, we can kind of stop a lot of the problems um, appearing in the first place. And, and I'm sure we would all agree that prevention is definitely much, much better than cure. Um, so that's our strategy to it. The digital platform that we've got is, is working really well because it means that you know, people anywhere in the world can access it. We also work with a lot of drinks companies who, who want to um, provide an extra level of support to the hospitality businesses that they work with. So sometimes they will purchase packages um, and then offer them to bars and restaurants um, as a value add to their contracts. Uh, so that's about all I've got to say today. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you um, tuning into the webinar. Hope you really enjoyed it and got a lot out of it. If you want to find out more, um, just check us out at healthyhospital.com is our website. You can find out all about what we do, get access to our digital training platform. We're also on all the social media. So thank you very much and have a lovely day. Great, and thank you to, to Tim for sharing the, this video message with us. Um, I think we can all agree it's sort of really, really important work. Um, some of the other speakers have touched on kind of people be, being really at the heart of retail. And we know there are big sort of skills shortages and it's as much about retaining as attracting new people into these roles that are really important. Um, and I would like to pass on to our final, but definitely not least speaker, uh, Professor Joshua Banfield um, from the Centre for Retail Research. Um, who's going to talk a little bit about the future health of the high street and the health of those people on it. Um, so the Centre for Retail Research uh, provides authoritative and expert research and analysis um, of the retail and allied service sectors in the UK, Europe and North America. Um, it's It was originally a university-led research group, um, first established in 1997, uh, and has since then been providing information on comparative retail trends for business groups, the government and the media over the last 25 plus years. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, over to you, Joshua. Well, good afternoon and thanks for the introduction, which was uh, unexpected. Um, <clears throat> as a, an organisation, the Centre for Retail Research looks obviously at what consumers are doing, but also looks at what uh, retailers are doing. And I think we've had more publicity from our forecasts of uh, what's happening to the retail sector than, uh, than anything else before. In the first seven weeks of uh, this year, 2000, uh, sorry, 2023, um, retailers uh, made announcements that were equivalent to 15,000 jobs being lost in the sector and 700 shops being closed. Last year, the total number of shops being closed was about 17,000. Um, it wasn't that these shops disappeared, of course. It's simply that businesses, whether giant companies or one-shop retailers, decided that the business was no longer viable and so should be closed down. As we've heard from Andrew, uh, this is, um, this is an, an, an increasing problem. It's important though not to exaggerate this problem. Retail is always undergoing change. It's just that at the moment, the change is very, very significant indeed. Um, in when it's over, if it, if it ever will be over, it's not that there won't be any shops at all. It's retail will be very, will be very, very different. And one of the implications for older people, of course, is that, um, the shop that you used to go, the department store you used to go to uh, Debenham say is now a um, set of flats for local students. Um, your favorite uh, clothes shop has become a, a Costa cafe shop. Other places have become tattoo parlors or places where you can have your fingernails, uh, uh, you can have your fingernails done. Um, and so, 
if you like, the, 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 basic, the basic fundamentals of the high street and the high street I remember and so on. Um, all, all, all these things are changing and this, and this creates a problem. But as I've said before, um, if you were to go to um, outer space and go to, let's say, your own city uh, in the 1950s, you'd see a much different state of affairs. And, uh, um, you know, we just have to accept that this change, uh, this, this change uh, goes on. Now, Andrew looked at some of the reasons uh, for this, the uh, very slow rate of growth in the uh, 2010s of the retail sector, the impact of COVID, and the fact that people seem to make give no thought to actually rubbishing the idea that people actually should go shopping in order to buy goods, uh, and the rapid increase in we're in the in online sales, online now represents twenty five percent of the retail market. Um, it may not grow as quickly as it has in the last two or three years over the next two or three years, uh, because online sales, online sales are actually slipping at the moment. Um, you know, but nonetheless, everybody expects online to remain as a, a, a very, very important and dynamic part of the, uh, part, part, of, part of the retail sector. Um, but what it means, obviously, is that uh, we're heading to a situation where high streets, whether we're talking about high streets in cities or in uh, smaller smaller market towns, there will be fewer shops in the high street. Possibly there will be less involvement, less emphasis on retail compared to other services than we've seen since the, since the 1950s. The uh, high streets will also be smaller, uh, shorter, if you like. Um, in some depressed areas, the shopping streets may may not exist at all. There will still be shops, uh, but the idea of, if you like, spending a Saturday afternoon going out shopping uh, just won't be available to them unless they go to a nearby nearby city. And obviously, online will be uh, will, will be will be increasingly important. Uh, but it's important not to exaggerate. But when we look at who suffers from this, it's it's not necessarily the old person over the age of 65, it's the people who are very old, um, let's say in their, in their 80s, 80, 85, who find, who have, let's say, mobility problems, find it difficult to get around, they may no longer drive a car and so on and so forth. Um, so um, people who live in rural areas will also face these difficulties and people with disabilities will, uh, will again, uh, will we'll, we'll again be sort of uh, put in a put in a rather undesirable position as as a result as a result of this. If we look at what's happened to uh, retail over the last twelve months, uh, retail sales in Britain fell by three point five percent last year, uh, but food retailing, but the volume sales, the volume shrank by five point eight percent. Now, I looked at um, the, the average increase in uh, volume sales of food over Britain in the, uh, in the 2010s, and it was an average of 1.5% every year. So this volume reduction of 5.8% is really significant. Although again, it shouldn't be exaggerated because some of it will be because people are no longer working from home, though plenty are still, um, and therefore, they're um, they're getting hold of their food in uh, they're getting hold of their food in different ways. But one of the bright spots of the retail sector are the uh, local food stores and the specialist food stores um, that probably comprise uh, the start of the fifteen the fifteen minute uh, uh, city. These have done quite well. They haven't done exceptionally well. Uh, but nonetheless, compared to the reductions that we saw in um, uh, in food retailing, uh, their sales have gone up by 1.6% last year. Um, and, uh, you know, at times they had increases in monetary sales of more than 10% in the last, uh, in, in, the, in, in the last couple of years. So some of these have done exceptionally well and others have not, have, have not done so well. 
And even though obviously the COVID pandemic is a bit less um, is a bit less pressing than it was in 2022 and 2021, um, many of these shops have managed to maintain enough of their customers to keep their customers coming, um, and so continue to continue to do more business with them. One of the problems that retailers have had is that be, because of COVID, the footfall in cities is down by 10% um, compared to uh, the situation in, in, in 2019. And it shows no sign of increasing. So people are really staying away from, uh, uh, from high streets or they're not going there in the way they did before. Now, one of the problems of these small shops, of course, is the um, increase in uh, in inflation, which has meant that people have become far more price conscious than they were before. But also the energy costs of heating a shop, of uh, running the um, uh, running the fridges and running the uh, the the, uh, the other cool cool units. Um, can, can often have uh, trebled. I was talking to a retailer last week whose electricity bill was £5,000 a month um, before the inflation, and now it's, and now it's trebled. It's £15,000 a month. Well, that's his profit. Uh, you know, so it's very, it's very, very difficult for, it, for him, for him to, to, to continue. One of the problems that I think older people are going to face is that retail is, is increasingly remote and it's going to be even remoter. Uh, and I think this is a, a danger or a problem for, the, for people who are elderly. Um, most people, when you survey them, sort of like the variety you get from modern supermarkets and shops. Um, as you know, as far as fruit and veg is concerned, um, there are, all, all the research shows that there are, there are two factors. One is, um, availability are there local shops to allow you to buy these uh, goods and secondly price in that um, price seems to be extremely important in deciding whether people are going to buy something and that's the reason why when you go into a food store usually the first thing you're faced with is not alcohol which is obviously very popular but will be fruit and veg because the variety of colors make it exciting and people will start buying as soon as they get into the shop. And from the point of view of a retailer, when people are buying, this is very exciting because this is what the shop, this is what the shop is for. Um, so the, everybody thinks that the variety is good. Perhaps there's too much variety and that the variety can be cut back in order to reduce uh, prices. And so give another impetus to buying fruit, 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 fruit and vegetables. But coming back to remoteness, virtually every store you go into these days, you find the member of staff is behind glass or behind uh, perspex. And that means for somebody who's got hearing problems, communication is extremely difficult. It's even more difficult because that person will often have a face mask on. Uh, and so, you, you know, even if you've got perfect hearing, you're not going to be able to hear them uh, uh, perfectly. Uh, to start with. The second aspect of remoteness is, of course, the growth of self-scanning. Now, self-scanning, of course, is, uh, you know, is, is, is extremely interesting. It's a way in which uh, um, customers can beat the queues that, uh, that, uh, that often exist. But nonetheless, many people find it very difficult to make it work. I must say, my... Um, Although I've put computers in shops in my uh, lifetime, and you would say oh, I'm familiar with computers, and I am, um, I've, I, for the first six months of self-scanning, I used to get really ratty. And, um, you know, I'm not, um, I suppose, the most untypical uh, old person that, uh, that, that, that you would ever meet. So I think self-scanning is a problem and uh, retailers have got to ensure that there are staff on hand in order to help and assist so that they become more confident about using it. Uh, and in addition to overcome some of the problems, the list of things that you can't buy without somebody saying, yes, they're old enough, uh, is uh, very long. Um, alcohol, wine, 
even fire lighters and matches and so on have got to go through this. So if you want to self scan, um, there needs to be somebody on hand to say, yes, this person is over the age of 21 or over the age of 18, what, what, whatever it is. I think the issue about small tins, you know, can we have small, can we have baked beans in small cans so that uh, people don't have to make it last two meals? I think that battle is really lost uh, simply because it's almost as cheap to buy a normal can of stuff than to buy than than to, than to buy than to buy small tins. So I don't really think there's going to be a lot of uh, change there. Though it may be that uh, advocates can um, get one or two retailers to say, well, let's go back to having small tins as well as uh, ordinary sized tins. Um, the other bugbear is, of course, staff, uh, sorry, store reorganization in that people can no longer find products. People of all ages can no longer find products uh, because the store has decided to reorganize. Obviously, the biggest reorganization in British history occurred as a result of government diktat in summer 2022 when they decided that the best way of stopping people buying foods that were too fatty or too sugary and otherwise unworthy of them was to uh, make it very, very hard. So yogurts are no longer sold alongside dairy, but hidden away in another part of the store. Um, we did some calculations that of the benefits that are supposed to accrue from this policy, and they are questionable, but nonetheless, there could be benefits. Something like half of them will be made up of the fact that people will be unable to buy products because they can't find them, or they have to spend extra time shopping in order, in order to find their way around. Uh, we've never published this, but nonetheless, we did it as, uh, we did it as, as, as an internal thing. Now, our feeling about, um, about the way in which retailers will respond to the problems of the uh, demographic uh, group is that, um, or this demographic group, is that you know the big the big jumps that people were looking for in the past? Remember, ten years ago we were talking about slow shopping. Probably are very unlikely because of the cost and financial uh, pressures that retailers are suffering from. But instead of which, there may be very many marginal gains that are possible to make that will still be worthwhile to the customers. And I know that retailers. Will want to join. Will want to join this once they're shown um, that these yeah. that these gains are worthwhile and they will be appreciated by they will be appreciated by customers. Um, the way in which retailers have become interested in dementia and how to treat dementia uh, mm -hmm. people with dementia is perhaps indicative of the changes that 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 can be made very, very quickly with Iceland probably as the um, um, as the uh, exemplar of you know what to do both training staff and also introducing systems uh, so that the pro so the problem is, is problem is easier so in other words these marginal changes can make life easier for the retailer mm -hmm. e easier for uh, the customer uh, making the customer perhaps more loyal than the customer was before. It will mean they're more confident in dealing with the store. And because there's staff available that can be asked, um, then when they have, they're more confident about using the store because there will be staff there in, or in, or in order to help them. Uh, one, of the, one of the criticisms or arguments that we get from older people is that you can't find a member of staff when you really need one. They're always carrying boxes around or re-merchandising uh, re -merchandising the shelf and so on. So extra help somehow or other needs to be made available in order to encourage these, uh, uh, the, these, um, uh, old, these older people who need help. And as well as older people, a lot of... Uh, a lot of younger people need 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 help as well. I've really enjoyed this uh, this uh, this webinar, and um, I've learned I've learned a lot from it. But um, 
one of the problems I think is that um, as well as one needs to be ambitious, but at the same time, accept the fact that retailers, you know, in the end have got to ensure that their store is as profitable as it can be, it's successful and this growing uh, demographic of older people uh, which has become going to become more and more important as the years go on, uh, feel welcome in their store and no longer invisible. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Oh, and the light just turned off when you finished there. Thank you. And I think you're completely right. It's about how you align it with, with incentives and make it the thing to do, not just from a um, sort of... Uh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Someone just turned the light back on again. Um, make it part of the sort of economic equation. So thank you so much. Um, I Just to, as a reminder, if you do have any other questions, we've got about 10, 15 minutes now um, for some discussion, then do pop them into the Q&A. Um, and I thought I'd like to, to kick us off really um, with with the point that really has only come up in the in the last discussion really um, on, on kind of online. Um, Obviously, it's it's changing a lot of what the physical high street looks like, um, and there's this whole kind of new realm. And I guess the sort of general question that I think we talk a lot about the challenges of, of things moving to online. Um, what what do you think are the opportunities in this space in terms of actually um, making the online environment an aspirational one as well, one where which can support health? Um, is anyone doing it well? You know what? What can we be doing to um, ensure that people aren't being left behind by that move, given that it is happening? I, I could throw in a, a another interesting example from Oxford. Um, mm -hmm. a, a colleague of mine has just built a new website for Oxford Covered Market. Um, Oxford Covered Market has been, I mean, it's it's been in existence since the 18th century, and uh, in recent years, it's been in sad decline. But in very recent years, place COVID, it started to uh, move forward in a positive direction. It's about to get about seven million pounds worth of additional investment, including outside seating to make it more visible. And uh, a colleague of mine has just built a new website for the covered market. A, it's experience led. So it's all about how people actually want to sort of use the market to enhance their lifestyle, uh, including you know, healthy options and sustainability. And B, the website itself is fully accessible. And this was a really, really important consideration of the council um, to ensure that um, everyone could access and use the website. And I think the answer to the question is, if assuming that's the case, or part of the answer is that um, for older people to be able to sit at home with a home computer or, or however it is they access, um, uh, the, the digital world, it can be quite helpful to be able to do their kind of homework before they venture out into the, the real world. Um, but that needs to be facilitated by the retailer or by the destination. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, well, I was, I was going to mention the need for truly accessible websites. I think um, that is something that is often overlooked um, and often it's done from a harder site perspective and not necessarily just a, an older person perspective, but um, difficult for the smaller retailers because it all comes down to investment and working with, with the right bodies in that respect. But but I think we've seen progress there. I think where, and, and, and one of the positives that came from COVID was, was if a shop is closed, as many thousands were as we know, then the only way to sell when your business, when your front doors close, is to actually do it online. So we saw this um, progression of of smaller retailers who, in the past, have probably seen online as a negative, as as started to embrace. The it was a more positive interaction interaction between um, consumer and shop through click and collect as opposed to deliveries, um, because. And, and this goes back to the point that the professor was making, I think, that if, if, a, con if a consumer can see what they want, and, and as I, I may be wrong on this, and please put me behind, but I think we are generally creatures of habit and we like to sort of, there's certain items we'll always buy. And it doesn't matter if I can't find them in the shop, I can order them and tell them, will you have that one ready? It's been like a prescription almost from the chemist, you know. Um, and, and I think what we saw was that, that there was a, um, 
uh, and the ability for certainly the smaller retailers embrace this where they said well tell me what you want some of them did it by phone call um so, and and come to the door and we'll give it to you um and and that expanded then into a, a broader smarter click and collect process but that still connects consumer with business it still brings consumer shopper out to the business which is important i think from, from the health perspective and it overcomes some of the issues that, that the professor quite rightly raised about pressures on store layout and where where regulatory aspects have these unintended consequences of just making it hard to find anything. Um, and, and, and so the internet is not necessarily a, a negative. Um, it can be embraced. It can be awareness needs improving. And I think on, on both sides, retailers and, and the shoppers. And I think I think you're right. I mean, not sort of typical face to face in store doesn't mean it has to be website driven either. It can be phone, it can be social media, it can be all sorts of things, really. Um, I guess one question and again, a few of you have touched on, I guess, in terms of the, the sort of what we'd consider the classic sort of high street um, and, and that kind of um, the high street and that place as a social hub potentially going back with the pandemic and um and i guess it, yeah a broad question to all of you in terms of clearly there is some places where there's active efforts i mean you mentioned um oxford there's stephen but do you think um do you think there is an appetite to build that back in other ways even if some of the stores might be going in these places and if more of the actual buying and selling of things is happening online I think there's a need and an opportunity. I mean, for example, another place I want to complain about is where I actually live, which is Abingdon, which is a beautiful, very historic uh, town on the river just south of Oxford with wonderful architecture. And uh, I think it was the professor who mentioned, you know, sort of coffee shops and nail bars and vape shops and, and hairdressers. This is all we have in Abingdon. And yet what we want is a greengrocer, a butcher, a fishmonger, a baker, you know, the, the traditional businesses that I think it's not just about being nostalgic, because I think that's a, along with the, the department store is what um, uh, older people might hark back to. But it's also completely in line with how we need to go as a as a planet uh, in terms of sustainability. You know, one of mm. the click and collect examples that we had locally was was our local uh, farm shop which um, developed click and collect overnight and has now a business that continues that it didn't have before um, and again it's all showcasing the fact that the produce is grown within a few miles of where where we live um, and um, you know dare I mention Jeremy Clarkson and the work that uh, he's doing with Clarkson's farm to actually show what it takes to produce food and, and then, you know, how wonderful it is if you can actually produce a wonderful restaurant with food that only comes uh, from, from the farm or from local farms. All these things are necessary, I think, as part of a sustainability journey and also to make the high street appealing again. And, and to build on that, Lily, I would say that and we started to, to make this representation of the government because in a way, um, I, I'm slightly disappointed that, that currently I'm working or part of a working group looking at a retail strategy um, with, with uh, Bayes, um, or as used to be Bayes anyway, Department of Trade now. Um, at the same time, there's a hospitality strategy being developed by associations represented in hospitality. And I'm sure somewhere there'll be a cultural strategy and then there'll be a leisure strategy and a residential strategy. And all these different strategies have one thing in common. They coexist on high streets throughout the UK. And, and I, I failed to understand. And what, what I think policymakers really have to understand is, and this comes down to planners, local authorities, people who, give, who are currently being given millions of pounds to spend on their towns and high streets. There isn't, you know, the best high streets out there, large or small, are vibrant because they're a set of interdependent businesses working together. It's not about one dominant factor. If you did all, all bars and restaurants, that's all you'll get. If you did all hairdressers, that's all you'll get. You, know, you need a combination in there. Now, retail will play a smaller part. I think the professor said, right, traditional retail shops may well become smaller in number, but no less important to the role they play on that in terms of creating that vibrancy and that diversity that, that, that 
that communities need. Um, and I think it's too easy to write retail off and say, well, people shop online, you don't need it. And it's sexier to, to encourage restaurants and hospitality venues or, or leisure, but you need culture, you need residential in there. And I think, I think there has to be a much clearer approach to high street strategy and planning. I mean, what Stephen was saying and that the space, um, spaceman is absolutely, absolutely correct. You need those aspects involved with, in there. You need diversity and you, you need to avoid closing your mind to um, sectors that may not seem buoyant at the moment or may seem to be in decline, but don't underestimate the important role they play. And that would be retail. Completely agreed. Um, Elsa, did you want to come in? Uh, you unmute. Always happens. Um, I wanted to um, to just add add to that. Um, uh, I reflect uh, what um, Professor Banfield says about um, uh, the the high street forever changing. And a, a, a very good example I heard about recently was in Harrogate, where there was a top shop, a huge top shop empty for several years and a um, uh, enterprising a developer purchased that and split it into three so now where there was one large department store uh, there is now a building society an independent coffee shop and a Sainsbury's which moved from uh, kind of behind the high street to to having that central presence on the high street and uh, uh, as Absolutely, I, I absolutely mourn the loss of um, uh, department stores, uh, but this metamorphosis of uh, of those huge spaces um, is is potentially giving the opportunity for um, independence to to move into a, a sector where um, where they were previously not able to afford. So, so I think that that's that's a, a, a great contribution. There's a development in Kendall as well in the Lake District, um, where an old department store, Beale store, I think it would be. Um, so ground floor individual units now that have been developed, um, some some commercial on the first floor and, and residential uh, above that, and and it just brings into use a big high silver building and it's empty, brings it into use in a much more productive way. I think there's um clearly coming out of COVID as well and with, with lots of offices reducing, um, or companies reducing office space and all these sort of new spaces that are becoming available. Actually, yes, there's there's all these challenges coming out of COVID, but also some opportunities to really plan how we use them. I'm so sorry, but we are coming somewhat up to time. So what I'd like to do, um, I'll give you all perhaps 10 seconds to think about this, um, is uh, if we can go around um, the, the sort of virtual room and think about the sort of, you know, if you had a magic policy planning, whatever wand, what's the one thing that you think could make a really big difference in this in this space and, and really make, you know, the, the places, the retail, um, the aspirational kind of places that we want them to be? Um, and sorry, I didn't give you much notice, but... Um, uh, and now I can't see you all. So, so perhaps Stephen, you're coming up first to me. What would be your one kind of thing that you'd love to see? Well, assuming there's there's a vision that's coherent and compelling, I think the cost of doing business. I mean, how do we get you know small businesses, startups, exciting producers, designers, makers, artisans to actually be able to be on the high street? It's got to be cheaper than it currently is. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Professor Bamfield. And I think you're on mute. Ali, yeah. I am. I am unmuted. Um, I, 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 I think that the um, occupancy costs are on the high street, and it's not only the high street, but everywhere, are far too high. They're higher than anywhere else in uh, Europe. And that's one reason why prices are, 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 are a bit high. Now, it's quite difficult at the moment to say to the government, look, I think you ought to uh, look at why it is that re the retail sector has to pay 25% of all business rates in the UK when there are, uh, it's only about 3% of total turnover. But nonetheless, people need to have this discussion because otherwise, um retail will retail will continue to drift the other quick 
policy change, I think, is to ensure that the planners wake up to what people want and allow um, allow the um, high street to be changed much more regularly than is the case at the moment. Whereas at the moment, they seem to be they seem to regard it as oh, it's architecture, but architecture doesn't enable you to continue. Architecture is just beautiful to look at. Thank you. And one of the questions we didn't get to today in the Q and A was was all around this kind of question of co co production. So um, we probably could have spoken about that for, for a whole session as well. Um, Andrew, um, totally agree with the, with the previous two comments. By the way, um, but I, I guess uh, to choose a, to strike a different note, there's a concern I think that the government. Um, as, as a stated aim of creating, making the UK highly productive, highly technology, um, high skills, high pay, strike economy. And, and one of the challenges for retail is that it's never been highly productive in that respect because it, it requires a lot of people to achieve a retail sale. Um, and, and, I, and I would urge policymakers to, to, to accept that actually, and, and retail owners, um, that our world is about people. And how, how, how we serve people, how we look after people, how we encourage and engage people. And that's often best done through people. Um, and, and it's not necessarily mostly productive, but it's longevity is there for all to see. That's why retail's existed for a long time and will continue to do so. But we shouldn't lose sight of people. Thank you. Um, Ailsa, Karen, would either of you like to add anything? Yes. I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I asked you both at the same time. <laughs> Elsa. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I was going to sort of move on a little bit. So you go first and then I'll, I'll sort of I'll bring up the rear. <laughs> no problem. Um, I think the the burden of business rates is really a, a cruel thing when you want to, uh, as an independent retailer, expand your business and better serve uh, uh, con uh, communities and neighbourhoods. So that would be my magic wand. Thank you, and Karen. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's anything that I can add to, to what the panel's already said on, on that front. Um, I was just going to say, you know, thanks for everyone but, uh, joining. I think it's been a real, I've, thank you to all the panellists. I, I found it really interesting. Um, and just to say that we'll be continuing to work with the ILC. So watch this space for, for future events on, on different topics. So that's it from me. Thank you. And lovely to work with you, Karen, as well. And thanks to all of us because I've I've learned loads and I think we've had a really busy chat as well. So lots of discussions going on there. Um, we will um, sort of be able to download questions that we haven't had a chance to answer. And I might share them with the panel um, and then we can share share lots of links and everything around. So thanks, everyone. Um, so much. Thanks again, um, Karen, for partnering with us on this. Um, and as Elsa alluded to at the beginning, we will soon um, be sharing our first guide for retailers as well that we'll be sharing with everyone who's who's joined today. So so thanks so much and and, and sorry for slightly overrunning. Um, have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.